Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to discuss normal labor and breach presentation. All right, let's dive in and let's start with false labor, also known as Braxton Hicks contractions. Now, these can be painful or non-painful uterine contractions, and they can be both regular and or irregular. Now, if they are irregular or infrequent, they're much more easily identified as Braxton Hicks contractions compared to the contractions of labor, which are regular and of increasing frequency. Now, these contractions, the Braxton Hicks contractions, also do not cause cervical dilation, and that's a huge difference between this type of contraction and the labor contractions. These also tend to decrease in intensity or stop over time, whereas the contractions of actual labor will get more intense and increase in, fre in frequency so that we can deliver the baby. Sometimes Braxton Hicks contractions may precede a latent phase of labor, something to just keep in mind. Now, moving on to actual labor, let's start with the first stage here. Now, the first stage of labor is defined as the moment labor begins. So the moment the patient says the contractions began to occur every three to five minutes for more than an hour. The first, stage, the, the first stage of labor consists of the latent phase and the active phase. During the latent phase, the cervical change is more gradual, whereas in the active phase, the changes occur quickly. The latent phase is defined as the period when cervical dilation is from 0 to 6 centimeters. The active phase starts at 6 centimeters to full cervical dilation of 10 centimeters. And that first stage of labor is going to be your longest stage of labor. All right, now let's talk second and third stages. The second, the second stage of labor is defined as the time period from full cervical dilation to delivery of the baby. This second stage is divided into passive phases and active phases, where the passive phase lasts from full cervical dilation to active efforts by the patient to deliver the baby. And the active phase lasts from the initiation of active efforts to expel the baby until the baby is actually delivered. Then the third and the final stage of labor consists of the time period from delivery of the baby to delivery of the placenta. Now, the way that progression through the first and second stage is assessed is via digital cervical examination. The digital cervical examination should occur at admission and then every two to four hours during the first stage and every one to two hours during the second stage. This examination provides important information on cervical dilation, effacement, as well as fetal station. Now, effacement is, of course, the, the assessment of the thinness of the cervix. And remember that as the cervix dilates, it gets thinner. Fetal station refers to which part of the fetus is the presenting part entering the birth canal first. Other times that a digital cervical exam would be performed outside of these scheduled times includes prior to administering analgesia and an anesthesia and or if the patient endorses feelings of an urge to push. At that point, we want to check to make sure that there is full dilation or else they'd be pushing against a cervix that's not dilated enough to actually allow for movement to occur. All right, what do we do if things don't progress at an appropriate rate? Well, if the patient's in the active phase and the cervix is dilating at a rate of less than one centimeter over two hours, then oxytocin should be administered. And the goal here with oxytocin is to stimulate uterine contraction and move the labor along. Now, if the patient has ruptured membranes and six centimeters or greater cervical dilation with no cervical change for four or more hours with adequate contractions, then the patient will be defined as being in active phase arrest. Similarly, if the patient has ruptured membranes and six centimeters or greater cervical dilation with no cervical change for six or more hours without adequate contractions, then they can be considered to be an active phase arrest. Okay. To avoid complications such as uterine rupture, the treatment for active phase arrest is going to be cesarean delivery. Now, as I mentioned earlier, oxytocin is used to help with active phase arrest, and it functions to increase contractile activity on the uterine smooth muscle. Now, other indications besides stimulation of labor include the induction of labor for those patients whom continuing pregnancy is higher risk than inducing. Oxytocin can also be used as an adjunct medication in the treatment of incomplete or inevitable abortion, as well as if the patient has postpartum hemorrhage or bleeding. Oxytocin at that point can be used to reduce that bleeding. The adverse effects, as you might guess based on oxytocin's ability to cause uterine contraction, is that the uterus may respond with inappropriate contractions. Now, the most common of these is known as tachycystole, which is defined as having more than five contractions in 10 minutes when averaged over a 30-minute period. Now, the problem with this rapid rate of contractions over such a short period of time is that the contractions cause an intermittent interruption in blood flow to the fetus, and if there's an excessive number of these contractions over a period of time, it could result in fetal hypoxemia as well as acidemia. Now, tachycystole is the most common adverse effect of the use of oxytocin, but it doesn't always result in any fetal heart rate changes or detriment to the fetus. 
Other uterine abnormalities that can cause that can be caused by oxytocin administration include spasms, hypertonicity, or rupture. Additionally, if an IV bolus of oxytocin is given, this can cause dramatic hypotension in the patient. Hyponatremia can also occur, although it's rare, and this is due to ADH-like activity of the drug leading to excessive water retention. All right, next up, let's talk fetal station. Fetal station is used to assess fetal descent during vaginal delivery. Now, we're going to use a scale from negative 5 centimeters to positive 5 centimeters, and that is used with zero, meaning that the presenting fetus is at the midway point between the ischial spines. Now, when the presenting part of the fetus is at the midway point between the ischial spines, this station is referred to as engaged. The negative values are how many centimeters above the ischial spine the presenting part of the fetus is, where the positive values are how many centimeters below the ischial spine. So if the presenting part is not palpable, this is referred to as a floating station. All right, now, as I've mentioned when discussing fetal station, the station's assessed based on the presenting part of the fetus. Typically, that's going to be the head. When the, pre when the presenting part, though, is not the head, we call this breach presentation. Now, there's three ways that breach presentation are categorized. We have frank breach. This is when both hips are flexed and both knees are extended with the feet next to the head. Complete breach is when both hips and both knees are flexed. And incomplete breach is when one or both hips are not completely flexed. Now, symptoms here include subcostal discomfort due to the fetal head being pressed against the fundus, and the patient may also feel kicking in the lower abdomen in the cases of complete or incomplete breach. Now, the diagnosis is made either on abdominal exam by palpating the presenting part. So if we feel the foot or we feel the buttocks, that's a way we can do it. And if there's any uncertainty, then we can do an ultrasound to confirm what is presenting. Is it the buttocks? Is it the feet? Etc. In the U.S., the ideal treatment is to attempt external cephalic version. This is a procedure that externally rotates the fetus from a breech presentation to a cephalic one. We're going to attempt this at 36 weeks or greater gestational age, and a tocolytic such as terbutaline uh, can be used to inhibit contractions of the uterine smooth muscle uh, and try and make the rotation more successful. Now, the clinician should attempt external cephalic version no more than three times in a single day. If they're unsuccessful, they can attempt again in a day or more. If the external cephalic version is successful, then subsequent vaginal birth can be attempted. But if that's unsuccessful, then a C-section should be planned. And we're going to do that because a planned cesarean birth uh, breach fetuses reduces perinatal death and severe morbidity. However, if your patient's opposed to a C-section delivery or they're concerned about the increased risk of future complications in childbearing having undergone a C-section, then sometimes a breach delivery is attempted but it's not the ideal treatment route. And if it doesn't work, then C-section is going to be what we end up doing anyway. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here is your first question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, you know what to do. Correct answer here is B. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you get the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is D. Our final question, I will put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button. And then when, once you've got the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is B. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one. Thank you.